So this is a two-hour lecture that I wrote across the last two hours. <laughs> but it is based on some material I've had before. Uh, it occurred to me, so I think I went, for example, I assumed uh, too much in terms of uh, some of the Bayesian learning. I thought Mark was going to do a bit more to introduce some Bayesian learning concepts. So I thought it might be fun to actually... Uh, go back to basics a little bit, um, which we didn't really do at the start of the summer school, and try and motivate machine learning a bit, and perhaps uh, what I like to call learning with uh, probabilities. Um, or, in this talk, that's what I'm calling it. So the slides might be a bit funny, because I've been sort of slapping them together and not proofreading them as I go through, but I'm sure it won't matter too much. So, um, what I, I thought I'd start with is actually... Um, just some sort of general stuff on what I think machine learning is. Because uh, some people tell you things like, oh, machine learning is just statistics. And I, I think, it, you know, you could also, people could perhaps argue machine learning is just optimization. What is machine learning? How, why was a new field of machine learning um, required? In the UK, there was actually, um, in the 1970s, I think it was, uh, there was something called the Light Hill Report that really set back AI research in the UK for many, many years because it said there was nothing being done in AI research that couldn't be done in a pre-existing field such as signal processing or statistics. So that there was no need for a new field of AI. Um, that was in the time of you know, uh, logic-based AI. But you, know, you could maybe try and make that argument today. Why is there a need for a field of machine learning when there's so much overlap between what we do and what many other fields do? So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, so we want to endow the computers with the ability to learn from data. So we present data from sensors, the internet, experiments, and then we expect the computers to make sensible decisions. Uh, where sensible, I don't know what sensible means, but you know, informally that's what we're expecting. And of course there are uh, three traditional categories of machine learning. Supervised learning, classification and regression. Now, I would argue that uh, these were certainly the areas when I started machine learning, classification was still considered a big challenge. Traditional classification, I'm presented with a set of inputs and a set of targets um, as training data, and I expect to be tested on inputs drawn from a similar distribution and targets drawn from the same sort of distribution. Uh, people did this with neural networks. Um, using uh, backpropagation to learn them. And in some sense, the success of neural networks, standard feed-forward neural networks, really was the core of the machine learning community. And then, of course, you've heard about the support vector machine. And I would argue, myself, my own perspective is that classification in that way is almost no longer interesting because it's a solved, solved problem from a research point of view. I mean, there are definitely interesting aspects such as semi-supervised learning, where you don't have, uh, you've got a lot of data without labels. Can you use that to improve your classification? Uh, Multitask learning, where you've done some learning from some related tasks, and you want to know, well, can you take information about learning what cows look like to help you understand sheep? Things like that. Um, that's definitely unresolved. But the classical thing we used to look at, the MNIST data set, Here's a bunch of handwritten digits. What's the class of the digits? As Bernard said, we can get to even slightly better than human performance on that data. And that was a big problem. You couldn't do that in 1996 when I started machine learning. Regression as well, standard regression. I think we have good methods for dealing with that. Personally, I use Gaussian processes. There are many variants of regression that are interesting. But uh, in some sense, I would say the, the, the classical standard supervised learning scenarios are things that are being less studied at the leading conferences, such as NIPS, ICML, UAI, the leading journals. Um, we're more into sort of things which might be thinking of unsupervised learning, such as deep learning. Um, of course, I've talked about dimensionality reduction already, clustering, Bayesian non-parametric models you're going to hear about from uh, Zubin. Um, and then I think probably one of the most challenging areas is reinforcement learning. And, and that's an area where there's still room for enormous amount of progress. So learning from delayed feedback where uh, you know, a robot uh, has to learn to make you a cup of tea 
but it doesn't, it doesn't really know much about the problem. It just gets a reward at the end. It's, um, how do you do that sort of thing? That's really a, a big challenge, and it's a, a, an area of a lot of ongoing research. So that's my sort of overview. Um, and there's a few different examples of learning. So what's the uh, history of machine learning? Well, I'd give you my personal perspective on um, what machine learning, where it comes from. And I think it comes out of this connectionist movement in artificial intelligence. So there, were, um, there was this area of artificial intelligence that was about specifying logical rules, um, expert systems, um, that really dominated in the 1970s. The early machine learning people were actually a lot, overlapped a lot with people in psychology. For example, Jeff Hinton has a background as a psychologist. Also, Mike Jordan has a background as a psychologist. Um, and there was this group of people, they called themselves the Parallel Distributed Processing Group. And there was this interesting mix at the time with the idea that in the brain, you had lots of distributed processing elements with high connectivity, um, and it was very robust, so you could take out cells and the system would still work, and the system would learn. So people were interested in trying to build computer models that had similar characteristics. And the movement was called connectionism. Um, and you can read about uh, it on uh, Wikipedia. Um, connectionism was the dominant force in machine learning, say, in the late 1990s. Um, but and it was actually sort of driven by um, ideas of models of the brain, and, and in particular, Rosenblatt, um, who built the so-called perceptron. So it was, I mean, I think there may even be videos of this. It was in 1962, a, a learning system which could try and classify digits, a very simple one that you may have heard about before. And it was even based on a very simple model of a neuron. So this is kind of quite powerfully exciting stuff. In 1962, you can do a bit of learning based on an existing model of the brain. Now, I think any neuroscientist would say it's a rubbish model of the brain. And as machine learning people, actually, it is still quite, for such a simple learning rule, um, if you kernelize it, you can do some quite powerful things. So, um, but it's a very simple system. Um, and, but I think that that area was inspirational for the connectionists, um, and people were looking at extending the perceptron, and the big sort of step forward was the multi-layer perceptron, or the neural network that people could use to do nonlinear classification. <laughs> so, to understand that joke, um, <laughs> you have to have a weird, geeky overlap mix between uh, some sort of Japanese um, computer game from the 1980s, <laughs> plus an understanding of risk, um, empirical risk, and uh, that mix generalization uh, for bounds based on VC dimension. Um, yeah, and, and Jan LeCun set up this photo. So, uh, but I'm using this photo um, to represent um, what happened to the machine learning community was that, I mean, what, so how does machine learning differ? Why am I very proud of what the community I came to at that time uh, did? It, in some sense, I think it's a very dangerous thing to be one of these communities that gets inspired by how the brain works and we're going to be like, uh, you know, we're going to use this stuff to do learning. And, you know, you can also do it for evolution. You get genetic algorithms or artificial life. You get um, particle swarm optimization, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it can be useful to be inspired by biological systems, absolutely. There is always a danger, though, that um, a large part of the research moves away from the theoretical side, is frightened of the mathematical side, and it just ends up hacking, playing with algorithms without any motivation. What I think was very good about um, the connectionists, and you, know, you can mention people like Mike Jordan and Jeff Hinton in this, they were never afraid of theoretical people that came on board. So you ended up in the early days, so Jeff Hinton used to go, um, they did this Boltzmann machine thing, which was a cognitive model inspired by Hopfield networks, I believe, with Terry Sadowski. But then they went out and told physicists about this model. And it's related to icing models. So you've got statistical physicists coming into the community. And rather than saying, oh, that's all too complex and doesn't matter in practice, they were absorbed into the community. So by the time I was in the community, there was this mix of engineers, uh, psychologists, very few computer scientists, actually, um, and uh, statistical physicists, mathematicians, 
interested in icing models, interested in this book, um, Hertz, Krug, and Palmer, is basically a statistical physics perspective on the sort of models people were looking at at the time. And that was the leading textbook, uh, I guess, until 1995 when Chris Bishop's first book came out and related everything to statistical pattern recognition, which is another step forward. So when I came in to the community, there was this big transition where people started looking. So Vapnik's work, um, support vector machines, um, kernel methods were all just emerging in 1996, okay? And that really um, revolutionized the field. So it went from being, you know, when I came in, the reason I could get involved in machine learning is I understood the chain rule for differentiation, okay? That's how it's quite complex, but that's how backpropagation worked. Um, if you look at the mathematical concepts you're hearing about here now, you're hearing Mark talking about uh, information geometry of parameter space for Bayesian modeling. You've got David Mackay in 1992, Three, I guess, starting to publish on Bayesian uh, models for neural networks. So you really have all this theoretical stuff being absorbed by the community and the community moving forward to an extent such that I think in many areas we actually overtook um, the fields we were competing with in terms of statistics, which at one stage was regarded as more rigorous than machine learning, but actually machine learning has really, you know, it's, it's putting a lot back in towards statistics. Um, so my sort of personal view is that machine learning benefited greatly by incorporating these early ideas from psychology, but not being afraid to incorporate rigorous theory. And one of the things you're seeing now is this return to those type of models with deep learning, these models of uh, difficult to um, analyze models, but they're doing amazing stuff algorithmically and actually doing some pretty incredible um, unsupervised learning with these models. Um, but instead of just people playing with those things and saying algorithmically, here's this. You've got people like Ian Murray doing great analyses of um, trying to do annealed importance sampling to estimate marginal likelihoods in these very complex models to try and understand better what's going on. And I think it's a very powerful community as a result of that. So I think early machine learning was viewed with a lot of skepticism by the statistics community. But certainly for me, um, say in the UK, a lot of the people I'm most interested in talking to are statisticians doing Bayesian learning um, in, or what I think of as Bayesian modeling. And there's now enormous um, interaction between machine learning and statistics. But I think there is still a difference. So when people tell you what's going on, they say to you, uh, it's, just, it's just statistics done in a hacky way or whatever. I think that's not true. My personal view is that the, the philosophy of the two fields is fundamentally different. Whatever you're doing at the moment, whatever your tasks are, if you are doing machine learning, you want to replace the human in the processing of your data set. So there was this, I had lunch at NIPS, we were doing a Gaussian process workshop, and Zubin uh, Garamani and Tony O'Hagan were there. Tony O'Hagan's a leading statistician who did a lot to introduce Gaussian processes to the statistics community and a very well-known Bayesian statistician. And Tony sort of said, I don't believe you can ever take a data set and um, just analyze it by computer without a human being involved in the loop to interpret the analysis, uh, which I sort of agree with in terms of the technology we have today. But Zubin immediately said, well, but unless you believe that the human's doing anything magical, unless you believe there's a ghost in the machine, uh, to put it one way, you should be able to replace whatever the human is doing as well. Now, I think that statistics as a community is about summarizing data to the extent that humans can interpret the data. So you, you try and say the mean of this data is seven. So if you, look, if you go back to when statistics became a field in its own right, they were often working with social science. So if you want to understand poverty in Manchester versus poverty in London, you could take the average income of the people in Manchester and find that it's 12 shillings and sixpence uh, per year. And you could take the average income of people in London and find it's 18 shillings per year. And then you want to know the difference, the fact that these numbers are different, does it mean anything? Are these populations different? So statistics itself, we know what that's like baseball. You, you say his batting average is, well, sorry, runs batted in is 0.4. Or in cricket, 
you know, you say the batting average is 30 runs. That's what statistics means. When we say statistics, we're talking mathematical statistics, which is really the study of whether the fact that those numbers are different means that the populations are different. And that's what statistics was set up to do. So it's set up to feed, to understand the numbers you're feeding to humans. But machine learning is set up to eliminate humans. <laughs> kind of. Fundamentally, we're aiming for the AI singularity, OK? I mean, fortunately, anyone in the field knows we're so far away from it that we don't have to worry yet. It's like the sun going out. But that is really our aim, that we don't want, you know, I, um, I presented the Gaussian process latent variable model to the, the stats group in Sheffield uh, once. Uh, and Tony Hagen was there, actually. But uh, at the end of it, one of the lecturers in the group said, OK, that's, okay, that's fine. But what do you tell the client? I'm like, who's the client? Statisticians are always worrying about a client. There's someone who comes to them with data, and they're trying to say something about the data, tell the client, computer p-value. I don't think we care about the client, because in some sense, we're just trying to integrate it in a computer program. I'm, I'm trying to provide a module in a computer program that has an end result like those faces. You can animate the faces, right? The client there is a graphics guy who's drawing. So I don't tell him anything. The computer does all of it. So I think that's the fundamental difference. But for the moment, the two overlap very strongly. Why do they overlap at the moment? Because we are not capable of replacing the human. So very often, we need to say something to the human about the data. So we're interested in computing these numbers and the sort of things statisticians do. Um, I think also, one of the main roles of statistics, again, these are personal views, but you can disagree or agree or whatever. Um, it, a lot of statistics, in terms of what the field was set up to do, was solved quite early on. So in terms of being able to infer, draw conclusions about data, about if you've got two sets of crops and you're fertilizing them in different ways, you want to know which fertilizer was better, randomizing the samples, these sort of ideas came out early. They're sort of model free. They allow you to infer things about the data, clinical trials. A lot of those questions, again, are solved. And statisticians have moved into things which are much more model based, which originally the field tried to avoid. So Bayesian, I think Bayesian statistics, personally, is a complete oxymoron. Because statistics set itself up as a field to avoid modeling. They didn't want to write down what was going on in the data because they were looking at social data where there was no physical model. They were what physicists were doing at the time was saying, I have a model of the universe, or I have Newton's equations. I can observe planets. I can infer the weight of the planet. They had a physical model. Statistics set, it up to say, set itself up to say, well, we don't understand anything about social interactions, but we can compute numbers and ask questions in a model-free way. So Bayesian statistics seems like an oxymoron to me because in, Bayesian, in the Bayesian world, you are always being explicit about your model. And that's what physicists do, actually, and did before statistics came and continue to do in parallel with statistics. So that's a sort of personal uh, feeling in philosophy, but actually that doesn't matter because today statisticians are doing Bayesian modeling all the time and they're doing it really, really well. So you know, it's, you know, a lot of statisticians would disagree with me there. So I think machine learning has this overlap with cognitive science, which is helpful. And it, it, um, it brings in a lot of insight. And I think particularly this, 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 um, this, this little point here is important. So you have to be careful about getting tied up in mathematical formalisms, because they can be misleading. Um, the fallacy that aerodynamically a bumblebee can't fly. I mean, people say, yeah, did you know that aerodynamically a bumblebee can't fly? <laughs> OK, that's the dumbest thing to say ever. Because it's a limitation of the model, not a fact. Yeah? So, and I was driving at this, you know, there was a theme to some of the stuff I was talking about in dimensionality reduction, about the curse of dimensionality, so on and so forth. You can get lost in mathematical proofs about what happens in these things, which actually betray what your own instincts are if you look at what humans are doing. So a lot of problems that we study are apparently NP-hard or whatever. It's in, the computer vision is insolvable, all this sort of thing. But in practice, cognitive science shows us that we're solving these problems all the time. Or we're capable of generalizing over a few examples, despite the fact that the statistical uh, underpinnings are not strong. 
So that's clearly a limitation of the model rather than the fact. That's the sort of bumblebee effect. Obviously, a bumblebee can fly. And the reason people say it aerodynamically can't fly is what they mean is if you apply the aerodynamic rules that you apply to a jumbo jet, under those rules, the bumblebee can't fly. But of course, the jumbo jet is flying under very different uh, Reynolds numbers to the bumblebee. The bumblebee, the effective viscosity to the bumblebee is much higher. So it's different, uh, it's, you need a different model. So mathematical foundations are still really important because they understand, help us understand the capabilities of, of our algorithms. But I think one thing that machine learning does really well is it's very good at going out empirically and saying, look at this result. I've created this crazy, funky, deep hierarchy of Boltzmann machines, and I can get this kind of supervised learning result, even though I can't prove much about when this will converge. Um, and so we mustn't restrict our ambitions to the limitations of current mathematical formalisms, and humans can give us a lot of inspiration in terms of our, what we can do in order to go and seek beyond um, the sort of standard mathematical models. So I guess I've already said this, early statistics had a lot of success with the idea of a statistical sort of proof in inverted commas. I computed the mean of these two tables of numbers. They're different. Does this prove anything? Well, it depends. And the answer depends on how many numbers generated, how many there are, and how big the difference is, and you, whether you randomized your samples, so on and so forth, whether it was correlation. Um, how, it leads to hypothesis testing. And, and I'm very subjected to this now because I work in an institute with a lot of doctors. And they always come into my office and say, can you compute a p-value for this? Because every experiment they do, they're expected to provide a p-value, even whether it's interesting or not. It's, it's important, though. It's an important area. It's not what I'm interested in. And classical hypothesis testing, the questions you can ask really about your data are quite limiting. So that can have the effect of limiting science, too. But there are many, many successes. So uh, who knows who student worked for? I mean, his name was actually Gossett. Guinness. But Guinness, yeah, there you go. Guinness is what? One of the largest brewing corporations in the world. Why are they one of the largest brewing corporations in the world? They early on adapted statistical methodologies to make sure they could brew beer consistently. Why is it that you can pick up wine from Australia that is very, very high quality? Because people did analysis of what was important in the creation of wine. These little variations that were occurring on a year-on-year -year basis, people get out, people avoid them now because they understand, even though they don't understand necessarily the system of what's going on in the brewing, precisely, they can check variations. If I add this much yeast, if I put it at this temperature, they can check which is significant with randomization and hypothesis testing. So Gossett worked for Guinness, and Guinness is one of the largest brewing companies in the world. He came up with the student tea, he came up with tea tests, these sort of things basically um, in an effort to help them uh, ensure they're brewing a consistent brew. Now, I don't know the details of the story, but I think a nice ending to that story would be that statistics enabled uh, Guinness to be the large, massive brewing company it is today. Certainly, uh, stout is overrated. Sorry, Neve. <laughs> so it can't be their fundamental product that... Uh, <laughs> I mean, for Christ's sake, they, they advertise it with Italians and Spanish and funky weird adverts all the time. So it can't be that it tastes good because they keep on having these weird things to advertise it. So it must be statistics. But there are many open questions. For example, I think that when you talk to statisticians, not all statisticians, but graduate level educated statisticians about causality, they are paranoid. They say you can't infer causality. It's not possible to infer causality. Yet, you know, when I did my first lecture, I don't think it worked anymore, but I kicked that thing there and the thing went off, right? Uh, that was the plug connector. I immediately inferred causality from one data point. So we know humans need causality and we may not always get it right, but statisticians became afraid of causality because correlation and causality doesn't necessarily imply causality. So they almost eliminated causality. I mean, there's many papers on it saying, you know, you remove causality in any analysis of data. If that's the case, then you know, all the human reasoning that we're doing, where we're all inferring causes, whether they're wrong or right, but to help us with an understanding a system, we do look for causality. Um, it's very different. It's, very, um, uh, it's wrong, according to statistics. But of course, it's not wrong. Um, it's an important open question. And 
you know, it's something that Bernard's looking at uh, extensively. He gave a NIPS uh, invited talk on it last year, and, and a lot of leading statisticians are looking at it as well. But traditionally, uh, statistics avoided causality. So there's William Seeley Gossett. And uh, they were sort of, I, I like to think of uh, the early statisticians, they're sort of Edwardian uh, English gentlemen. Uh, and I think that's a classic Edwardian English gentleman. I'm glad I, I didn't live in those days because I could never have grown that moustache. <laughs> this is like uh, eight days growth. <laughs> so I'm glad I'm not Edwardian. Um, so, and as I mentioned already, that, that statistics is really about computing numbers and really Math mathematical statistics is, is the world that we're interested in. <clears throat> so machine learning and probability, where does probability coming in to machine learning? Well, the world is an uncertain place. For example, I got up today expecting to sit quietly in the audience for six hours of lectures, and you know, things happen, things change, and you need to deal with that. So epistemic uncertainty is one type of uncertainty. So this is uncertainty arising through lack of knowledge. So what color socks is that person wearing? So what color socks am I wearing? No, oh, very good, you see. <laughs> um, normally that works better in England when you're giving your lectures in the middle of the winter. <laughs> um, and then aleatoric uncertainty is uncertainty arising through an underlying stochastic system. So if I, if I take a sheet of paper here and I drop it, where will it fall? Well, I could do it similar way many, many times, and I wouldn't be able to say. Now, those are the two broad categories of uncertainty, and here's the re this is the right way to think about these uncertainties, right? So, there's two ways of watching a football match, right? You watch it live, and that's aleatoric uncertainty. The other one is you can't watch it live <clears throat> because you're at work or something, and you record it on your video recorder or your Sky Plus box or whatever, and then you come back later, or it was on really early in the morning, and you play it as if it was live. Now, as far as you're concerned, if you don't know the result, it's a bit spoiled if someone walks in and says, oh, they won, you know. But as long as you can maintain the illusion that you don't know the result, the uncertainty is the same. There is an actual difference, and this difference uh, was brought home to me when I was doing this with rugby, England versus France um, in the World Cup uh, semi-final, I think it was. I've tried to forget about it. Um, uh, we had a really good, no, quarterfinals it was, I think, to get to the semi-final. We had an excellent run to the, the team was rubbish, but they just had to beat France that weren't looking that good, and I started watching the game, and they were just appalling, uh, and they were down by a certain number of points, and I thought, I can't, you know, I'm just going to go and check what the final score was. Uh, so I left and went and looked. Obviously, you can't do that if it's aleatoric, if you're watching it live, but I was watching it recorded. So I do a lot of watching recorded, and that's epistemic uncertainty, because I can always go and find out. The result is known, I just don't know it. Um, with aleatoric, is the result is unknown. Now, there's a sort of overlap thing here, which is that why does this thing drop in different ways every time I drop it? It's, I assume it's uh, slightly different initial conditions, chaos theory, yeah? Very small variations in initial conditions, even in a deterministic system. So actually, or I think pretty much, unless you get down to the quantum level, and I don't understand quantum mechanics enough to make a claim about that, but let's ignore quantum levels. Let's just assume that this is chaos causing these things. All aleatoric uncertainty in some sense is epistemic uncertainty. If you knew precisely the initial conditions with which I'm dropping it and the state of everything in the room, then we would be able to compute where that would land. But such small variations effectively make this statistical noise, aleatoric uncertainty. Um, so Laplace, this is called Laplace's indeterminism. Um, to some, well, that's really about epistemic uncertainty, but the two overlap a little bit more, I think, than, than we're being honest about here, because fundamentally, the aleatoric uncertainty is something that is occurring because I don't understand the initial conditions. But let's think about, I mean, but let's just make the division. Let's assume that is genuinely stochastic um, and epistemic isn't. OK, so we need a framework to characterize this uncertainty. And we, we use probability for doing that. It's one of the frameworks. So uh, people talk about Thomas Bayes. But number one, we don't really have a picture of Thomas Bayes. The one people show 
is unlikely to be Thomas Bayes, because Thomas Bayes was a nonconformist minister, and that's what nonconformist ministers look like. They have big wigs. Uh, and uh, this is Richard Price, who was a Welsh philosopher and essay writer. And if you read Thomas Bayes' essay, you, he, there's a long introduction to it, um, and then there's an essay. Uh, and the, the introduction is written by Price, who also edited the essay. The introduction is really easy to understand, and the essay isn't. So a lot of the claims for what's going on in the essay are written by this guy, Richard Price, who we know a lot more about. He's also a political essayist. Um, he's involved in, uh, you know, he was writing about the American Revolution. He's interesting. He's more like a Benjamin Franklin type figure, whereas Thomas Bayes we know very little about. But he was the one that presented it to the Royal Society. Um, and you can read about Richard Price uh, online. He was Welsh and he came to London. Um, and one of my best friends is called Jonathan Price, and I don't know if he's related or not. Probably not. <laughs> but then who's the man? This is to me is the man, Laplace. So Laplace actually didn't know about Thomas Bayes, but he came to similar conclusions about how you should try and deal with data and dealing with uncertainty uh, independently. And I think he almost did. If you read Laplace, I don't think I do anything that Laplace hadn't thought of. Of course, I have a computer, so I can empirically do things that he thought of but couldn't do in practice. Um, Laplace was interested in, initially he was interested in gambling, so he was interested in uh, if a dice was unfair, for example. How could you tell when the dice was unfair? Uh, and, and the French called this an English dice. <laughs> I don't know what the English called uh, an unfair dice. But actually he reduces, he looks at binomial, he looks at a coin. Um, coin tosses, and he looks at, he does, he does a Bayesian treatment of coin tosses. He doesn't know about um, uh, beta distributions, um, so he can't compute a beta posterior. And what he actually does is he's the second person to write down the Gaussian distribution after the Moivre, and he writes it down in computing a Bayesian posterior of a dice flip using Laplace's approximation, the second order expansion about the mode. Um, and he's doing that in, I think, the 17, late 1700s. That's pretty incredible. The, he, you know, so Laplace approximation, which is still one of the standard methods of approximating Bayesian inference, he invented the Gaussian distribution to do it. So I think that's pretty cool that the Gaussian distribution was invented for Bayesian inference. He also shows in his paper, which again, the translation's quite readable and the notation is very modern. So if you're French, I suspect the original paper is quite readable. He shows that in the limit, as the data goes high, that the Laplace approximation becomes correct. So, and he's considering that limit. So for him, it's not even uh, an approximation. But he didn't know about the beta distribution. The system he looks at is completely analytic for us today. But, uh, I guess the, the normalizer of the beta distribution wasn't known at that time. Okay, so the classic sort of thing we tend to do in machine learning, moving away a bit from motivation and philosophy. I forgot to look at time. I have no idea of time, so uh, let me just... Oh, that's not too bad, is it? Um, is inputs and targets. Um, so... We've got some set of inputs, and we want to predict a target. And for binary classification, that should either be one or minus one. So the sort of examples we've already talked about, document categorization, uh, who a fa detected face belongs to, detecting faces and images, classifying digits from binary data. Now, the perceptron is really the foundation of machine learning in the sense that you take a data point xi, and you predict that it belongs to a class yi if the sum of some weights times that input plus a bias is greater than zero. Uh, so I like the vector notation, so there it is in vector notation. The inner product between the weights and the input plus a bias is greater than zero. Otherwise, we assume it's minus one. That was what Rosenblatt sort of said in 1957. He died quite young, unfortunately. Um, there's a memorial to him at his old institution. So. The perceptron algorithm is uh, really quite cool. It actually can be solved by linear programming. Um, and uh, it is just a linear program because, uh, so unfortunately, the one bit they did manage to wipe off. <laughs> when you look, uh, so the perceptron algorithm is just looking for a feasible region in the W space. So you can draw it in two ways. You can draw. Um, 
the vector w in a two-dimensional space, I shouldn't put those in because that's like maximum margin. Um, you're looking for a linearly separable region. You're satisfied, you're feasible if you can get all the negative points on one side and all the positive points on the other side. But there's another way of drawing it. So in this case, you've got one W, and you draw the W, and you're drawing it in X space, and the Xs are points in the X space, right? Now, what Robert was talking about, or I believe he was drawing earlier, is the, what we would, he, the feasible region, which we would think of as the version space, this is sometimes called. So these are now linear constraints. Every data point is providing a linear constraint. If you draw in W space, then the weight vector you're interested in is now a point, as the x's were in here. And every data point provides, well, actually, it's the data times its label, provides a linear constraint. OK? So every data point is giving you a linear constraint, which gives you a feasible region. And the perceptron algorithm is actually an odd way, which um, I think, uh, I can't, Robert, do you know about its worst case performance or anything? It's got weird worst case, but its average case, I think, is good. Uh, yeah, it's, it has been analyzed a bit uh, in terms of linear programming. I, I'm not sure of the details. But it has, I think, very bad worst case performance, but quite good average case performance. So you've got all these uh, data points here, these zeros. Uh, you've got the y, which uh, dictates uh, which direction this arrow is pointing in. Um, and if you, for example, had this data point change label like this, then that region becomes, and then you've got no feasible region. Yeah. So that's an inseparable problem in the perceptron algorithm. The other weird thing about when you do have un inseparable problems within the perceptron algorithm, um, you do end up with a reasonable solution. If you, if you, there's a learning rate, and if you reduce the learning rate um, in a slow enough way, you will actually find. Uh, the optimal hyperplane. This was the sort of thing that was known in 19, well, it was known easily by the 1990s when I came into the field. And the algorithm is basically you, you take uh, the weights and you add to the weight some learning rate times the label value times the data point value. What that says, so if the, so you iterate, you select an, not an increment K, an increment uh, uh, eta. And you select a misclassified point. You ignore uh, any points that are correctly classified. So for example, um, if you're here, if your weight solution is here, then all these solutions are fine. It's only this one that you're infringing. So you select this guy, and you update in that direction, basically. So, and you, up, you may actually go beyond. You don't do anything intelligent. You just take a learning rate, I guess, in the uh, I don't really understand enough in the simplex method to understand, uh, but you could, it, perhaps the case that, I don't know, you're doing something definitely more intelligent than the simplex method, you won't overshoot. Um, here you could potentially overshoot, but then you look at this one and you go back again. Yeah? So I've got a little uh, visualization of that, and this is all historic stuff. So here's a simple data set, and what we do is um, we select initially some data point, and we build the initial decision boundary based on that data point only. So we start with the weights being zero, and for the first iteration, we set the weight vector to one of the data point values, which in this case, that. I've selected that data point I circled, and that's the result. So we turn, multiply the observed value of the data point um, times its uh, class. Then we go through selecting incorrectly classified data points. So I've circled one there, which is incorrectly classified, and we do this update. We multiply that incorrectly classified data point by its label um, and, and adjust the weight vector. Now, very often, this converges very quickly. So there's that one green point there that is now incorrectly classified, yeah? And then all data are now correctly classified. Now that's just an example I set up that is separable, that has two Gaussian, uh, Gaussian distributions. The feasible region would be any region in here that we can bend that uh, point and not without misclassifying that or misclassifying that. So there's a small feasible region that we could find. The support vector machine work is about making that solution unique. 
by adding a quadratic term so that you get a quadratic programming program with linear constraints and you look for the maximum margin separation. Now, the fun thing about Rosenblatt when he specifies this learning rule is I don't think he's... Well, I haven't read the original paper, but I think it's just an intuitive learning rule that, you know, that you should... If you've got something wrong, you should look at the thing you've got wrong and you should add it into your uh, weight vector. But it still works. And it leads to things like Hebbian learning... Um, which people use for Hopfield networks. But they were, and Hebbian learning is something that I've, I believe there's some evidence for existing uh, between neurons in the brain. So there's that nice connection there. So regression examples uh, predict y given x. Um, in the y given x, we define an error function now, which is, uh, so we have some, in the linear case, we say that we've got some function of x, which is a gradient plus an offset. And then we might define an error function in that case, which is the distance between our um, data and our uh, target function. So we can add a portion of the error to the bias, and what we then also try and do is add um, uh, some of the error to the gradient. Now, this we can do iterative learning of these things by updating the bias and the intercept in a very similar way to the perceptron. Um, and you get the same sort of effect. As we select every data point in turn, we can actually update a linear regression. Now, you'll all know that this isn't the sort of standard way of doing linear regression, but this is a sort of stochastic gradient descent version of linear regression. So we're updating and actually an underlying error function. Now, but I think people didn't think about that so much in the early days of machine learning. So you do it until you have a solution that fits. Now, of course, that's solvable with uh, a little bit of linear algebra, and that's how we all do it today. But I think in early machine learning days, people were interested in learning rules more than they were interested in an objective function because they wanted to know how neurons were updating their own weights. And, of course, we can go to nonlinear cases. So if the x is not linearly related to y, then we create a feature space, and you've already seen me do this before. So here we've got a function of x, which is equal to some inner product between the basis functions and uh, our weights. And if we apply the same sort of rules to those weights, we can also do it for the perceptron. So here's a basis. This is a quadratic basis. So it's got uh, three different parts. Um, and we can sample from the quadratic basis by, so we can look at, as I was doing in the kernel PCA lecture, we can say, well, for some random values of W, what sort of functions can this produce? And they're obviously all quadratics. So we sample three random values of W. Here we're sampling W1, which is the offset is 0.87. W2 is minus uh, 0.38835. And W3 is minus 2.58. And these are the bases, and this is the weighted sum of those bases. So we've got uh, some positive weight on W1, so 0.87, so around there. So that value should be 0.87 um, at zero there. We've got a, a negative weight on the linear function, so it's slightly negative going down in this way. So you can see that this side of the quadratic is actually lower than this side, even though the axes are symmetric. Um, and then we've got a negative weight, minus 2, on the quadratic term. So the quadratic form is showing quite strongly. Um, double what it was in the first one. Well, it should be quadruple or something. So that's about 0.7 or something. So it's been, oh, and then it's got the linear term added, so it'll be lower still. And we can sum those three things together, and we get a function that's nonlinear. And that's what we think of as the feature space. And Bernard's talked about that. So here's another example where we've got a much lower weight on the quadratic term, so the nonlinearity is less. And another example with a positive weight on the quadratic term and a negative weight on the constant term and a slightly negative on the linear. So you can sample different functions according to this system. Now, the systems that I like a bit more than that, because they're local, are the radial basis function type systems we've already talked about. And in this case, we've got, uh, for example, three bases. And the three bases can be summed together 
in a similar way. So we've got basis function one has this uh, center here, minus one, basis function two has a center of zero, and basis function three has a center of one. And what we're doing to create function in this case is a weighted sum, for example, with a Gaussian sample from W to generate random functions, which give us functions like this. So here we've got a small negative weight on the first basis, so you, that's leading to this small bump. We've got a oh, small negative weight on the second basis, but it's smaller, so we actually go up a little bit, and a largish negative weight on the, second, on the third basis. And we can keep doing functions like that with similar results. So in that case, the weight on the second basis is very small, so it hardly appears. There we've got uh, three positive weights. And we can even learn in simple systems like this using the same learning rule we had before. And I like these examples. This is not how you do function learning, but in this case, you can show how a function responds locally. So this, because of the learning rule is now based on the basis, then you only upweight things which are nearby um, your data point. And this is the sort of thing we used to look at a lot, the, what the nature of the learning rule was, um, and iteratively update one data point at a time, but we were doing it in more complex systems like neural networks. The Lynette systems that were state-of-the-art on um, uh, digit recognition were doing this, one data point at a time. Instead of doing what you might think is the right thing to do, when it, it would be certainly for this model, which is to try and do some sort of batch optimization, uh, some second order method, or so eventually the function doesn't change. But really what's going on in these systems? What's the mathematical interpretation? So we like looking at those learning rules, I think particularly because there was a cognitive science inspiration for machine learning. But fundamentally, these learning rules are minimizing this error function, right? So this is an error function that is the classic sum of squares that uh, Robert talked about, sum across data points between the square difference between the output of the function and uh, the data point uh, yi. Um, and that's the sum of squares error. Now, I always get confused. Who, who invented the sum of squares error? Anyone? I mean, someone did, but anyone know? <laughs> Mr. Square? Pardon? Mr. Square. Mr. Square. <laughs> Mr. Least and Mr. Square work together. <laughs> I, I'm asking this primarily because I, I always forget there's too many Frenchmen starting with le and la, and I get confused between them. I think it was Legendre, but it might have been Lagrange. <laughs> was it Legendre? Come on, someone look it up. Someone with the internet look it up. <laughs> um, the, the, okay, well, actually, I want to come back to this point again later. Why did they invent least squares? They invented least squares because they were making observations of planets, uh, and they had more unknowns. Sorry more observations than unknowns. So they knew about solving systems of simultaneous equations, but they had more observations than unknowns. So which solution should they use? And least squares was the approach for um, doing that. Now Gauss also claims to have invented least squares, and he claims he found uh, the planet Ceres, uh, its orbit, by applying least squares before Legendre, uh, Legendre um, published, or Lagrange, whichever one. <laughs> so, here, there's now a cost function, and we can build design matrices, and the cost function expresses the mismatch between our um, prediction and reality. And here I'm defining in the red phi i as being the evaluation of the uh, basis function for um, each of the, well for each of the basis functions. So there's this in, I'm replacing in effect. So I'm moving to a Vector notation, which you know, as, as you know, I like. So I'm, I'm replacing that with an inner product. So W is your vector of parameters, and phi i is the basis function values for one data point. So we can minimize that. We can compute its error. Um, and what we find is that the gradient of the basis function is equal to the current error. So you're always updating according to the error in both those perceptron examples and the regression examples. And in, in this case, this sort of error 
the current error, this isn't the error function, but what the people used to call the error was the difference between the observation and the target value. So that's the gradient um, for all the data points. Um, and the gradient for we, what we can do is minimize that by steepest descent. So we initialize the algorithm with some value w, and we compute the gradient and go downhill. Of course, again, this is analytic to optimize, but illustratively speaking, this is a sort of steepest descent type approach. So you compute the gradient, and this is the quadratic form of the error function, and you start heading down towards the minimum. Fortunately, this actually goes very, very slowly uh, once it starts getting, okay, so the jump there wasn't because it started going fast. That's nine iterations, that's 10, that's 20 iterations, that's 30 iterations, 40 iterations, 50, 100 iterations, 150. So here you're using the learning rule of, to take the weight and update it by the sum of all the gradients of each data point. So it can take a very long time. Now, stochastic gradient descent is something that machine learning people started doing back in the 90s and do an enormous amount now. And the reason is because it tends to give you much faster solutions for very large data sets. So in stochastic gradient descent, that's the, what, the algorithm we effectively saw for the perceptron and the regression problems earlier, that you take one data point and you look at its error and you update your weight function according to that. So stochastic gradient descent works very well if you've got 25 million data points. Because if you've got 25 million data points, you need to compute the actual gradient to sum up the gradient with respect to each of those data points, 25 million sum. But stochastic gradient says, says don't bother doing that. Just go in and update according to the gradient of each individual data point. Now, stochastic gradient descent has this uh, learning rate parameter. Okay, so just this is, this is standard gradient descent with the sum over all da n data points. So your update rule is the weight vector is equal to the old weight vector minus the gradient. You descend the gradient. Stochastic gradient descent says, well, let's change, look at that. Uh, oh, wait. Okay, so let's take that function there and say that's the error, uh, that bit in red. Define that as the delta y that we've seen before. And then let's replace the delta yi, uh, the sum over n, with multiple repeats of doing it for each individual data point. So this isn't exactly the same as that, because here we're updating the weight function once for all n. Here we're updating the weight function for the first uh, w, and then that changes this delta yi. So every time you iterate, you're updating w. So these aren't exactly the same thing. But if you have uh, a, um, if you have a sort of reduction uh, criterion for your steepest descent, your learning rate, if you reduce this in the right way, it turns out that this provably converges. What the right way is, is an open question, and very often, you know, I think formal convergence on these things, I don't know the details of how people claim they've achieved it, but certainly in practice on that, uh, Func the function we looked at before, this is the sort of effect you get. Now, we're not following exactly the gradient, we're following, this is the same example I showed you earlier with the basis functions, we're following that gradient with respect to one uh, data point, and then you see it sort of wiggles around a little bit, but broadly speaking, it goes in the right way. Sometimes with small steps, sometimes with large, because it depends on the value of the basis functions at each step. So while there are many iterations here, each iteration is only looking at one data point. So the value of this comes when you've got very large data sets. If you look down in the valley below, it's actually wiggling around. That's why it's sort of called stochastic. On average, it tends to go in the right direction. But for very large data sets, which this isn't one, this tends to be much faster than computing the correct gradient at each data point. And you'll see people are using that, Neve. Did I? Whereabouts? Oh, was there a typo? Yeah. Um, yeah, there probably was a typo. Uh, yes, sorry, yes, that's a typo. Yeah. Thanks, Neve. That, uh, this here, oh, where's my mouse? Oh, there it is. That should be a negative. 
Okay, because we're descending the gradient. That's right, thanks. Um, so we can get a, an approximation to the gradient with stochastic gradient descent, which is often much faster to use in practice. And this is how, say, uh, Jan LeCun was doing um, MNIST on 60,000 digits in the late 1990s or even early 1990s. You could do it because you didn't have to solve a large op. You weren't looking at quadratic error. You were looking at 60,000 digits. You present each digit one after the other, um, update the weight function of the, the weights of the neural network. So that was an adaptive uh, basis system, which he constructed to include translation invariances and various things. Uh, it was a very impressive piece of work uh, in the late 90s. And it all worked because of stochastic gradient descent. As a field, we sort of kind of forgot about stochastic gradient descent for a while, but it's now come back in, I think, in a big way for deep learning. People are using it a lot for deep learning. It's difficult to analyze. We used to call it online learning. Why don't we call it online learning anymore? Okay, I guess because that means doing a course on the internet. <laughs> but we didn't have the internet back then, so we called it online learning. And a lot of the statistical physics analysis was about trying to understand the characteristics of that in certain systems. For example, it's known that it often plateaus. Um, uh, so you start really nicely. Often the, the error function goes down, and then it seems to plateau, and then it goes down again in neural networks. And people did a lot of uh, analyses. In fact, my close colleague, Magnus Rattray, uh, has some classic papers on on, on this plateau effect, and, and it's important because you want a long learning rate in this region and a short learning rate in the other region. And if you read... Um, Jeff Hinton's paper still today, if you read the SNE paper, there's a large amount in the paper about how he started off with this learning rate and then he switched to that learning rate. And, and old papers used to have a lot about that. But it was a sort of little bit heuristic um, and uh, less difficult to formalize some of the uh, minimization. So the modern view of error functions is, of course, uh, one of the following. Either the error function has a probabilistic interpretation, in which case you're typically doing maximum likelihood. And this is the modern view. When I say that, I mean from the perspective of machine learning. Uh, Gauss and Laplace knew that, so that's not that modern. Uh, or the error function is an actual loss function that you want to minimize. So that's empirical risk minimization, which Bernard talked about. And I think that you can broadly see that the field is, has been split along those two lines. People either take one perspective or the other. I mean, this is a broad generalization. So I tend to think, ah, oh, the error function is a probabilistic thing. So what I should really do is worry about my probabilistic model. If you bring an application to me, I start writing down a probabilistic model. Whereas a sort of Bernard would probably think more in these points of view. So if you bring an application to him, he would typically start writing down an optimization problem. Um, now, the two things that then happen is you either can't solve the probabilistic model because it's non-analytic, or the optimization is NP-hard. So what I do is I then look for either a simpler version of the probabilistic model that is analytic, or I look to do approximate inference by sampling or variational methods or the Laplace approximation. What I think the optimization people do is they tend to relax the optimization. So they say, well, I really want, and a classic example is L1 minimization type problems. So they say, I really want to minimize to find a sparse solution. And the way I should find a sparse solution is by using the L0 norm on the parameters of my regression. But that's not tractable because which uh, the L0 norm is drawn in the weight space. So again, you can think of this is like the, in the version space. The L0 norm is, is stacked up along the um, axes. So you can't even really draw it properly. It's like a sort of a, if everything's, the L0 norm counts the number of non-zero terms. So if every weight in your vector is a zero, then the L0 norm is like a, a pointy stick sticking out of the axis. And, it, and then if this one here is zero, but the others are non-zero, you get these lines going along the axis. So it's basically a star um, in the, weight space. It says, I prefer things close to the center or on the axis. And people tend to relax that to the L1 norm, which is actually a square, and it leads to convex optimization. So 
that's the sort of relaxation people use for sparse models, but people use very many different relaxations for clustering. Spectral clustering is formulated around a relaxation from a discrete allocation of data points to a continuous version of the allocation. So that's my broad perspective, and I don't do that, so I'm not an expert, so I'm making that up a bit. Um, but I definitely do this, um, and in this case, we do, we look at the intractabilities and we try and approximate in one of a number of ways. So if you look at the um, uh, last 15 years of machine learning research, has mainly focused on probabilistic interpretation. So let's, you know, uh, graphical models uh, are actually a way of doing um, probabilistic graphical models of either doing exactly with the junction tree algorithms, graphical models over high dimensional discrete variables by specifying conditional independencies. Um, Gaussian processes are a way of doing probabilistic modeling over functions. Um, Semi-definite programming has become a big thing as a relaxation of certain, um, or even as the thing you want to do, the objective function you want to minimize. I mean, uh, people are doing uh, quadratic programming, of course, for the support vector machine. So you can broadly see, I think, most of uh, the last sort of 15 years of machine learning as focusing on one of those two things. So the things that I've not been talking about is, is how you do that. Some of that uh, has been covered by Robert. Um, second order methods, conjugate gradient, quasi-Newton and Newton. Um, effective heuristics, such as people, when they do online gradient descent, they use something called momentum, uh, or stochastic gradient descent, I should say. OK, so unsupervised learning. K-means clustering is the, uh, I guess, the classic example I just want to talk about briefly in unsupervised learning. So in clustering, which is a classical machine learning, uh, again, it's also used in statistics, um, requirement where you want to divide groups into according to different characteristics of the groups. So an example there would be different animal species or different political parties. Um, and what we want to do is determine which groups they move into. And what's harder is perhaps the number of different groups. So for k-means clustering, we might require a set of k cluster centers. This is the classic algorithm. We want to know where the center of those clusters are and the assignment of each data point to those centers. So the algorithm there, simple algorithm that I want to sort of uh, talk about, I'll get onto it, but in terms of how it turns when you consider probability, initialize the cluster centers on data points assign each data point to the nearest cluster center and update each cluster center by setting it to the mean of assigned data points. So the objective that people do in k-means clustering is they have a number of clusters k, which is associated with centers, and then a number of data y. And what you try and do is you minimize the sum across all clusters of the data points allocated to that cluster. So for those i's that are allocated to j, of the squared distance between the mean and the data points. So this minimizes the sum of the Euclidean squared distance between point, points and their associated cluster centers. Now, k-means clustering is not guaranteed to be a global minimum or unique when you apply this algorithm. And this is a non-convex optimization problem. So this is difficult to solve, but it's actually fast to solve if you use such an algorithm. So here we've got some data. We initialize clusters randomly from the data. We then allocate all data points to their closest cluster center. We update the cluster centers to the mean of their allocated data points, and then update each center according to the uh, new mean. And we repeat that process, and then eventually you, don't, you get no change in cluster allocation. So I wanted to talk about this briefly because it's another simple algorithm that actually has a more complex interpretation when you look at it probabilistically. And we'll come back to that after I try and motivate why you go to probability instead of standard error functions. So it's got two steps. One is an update of the means. And one is an update of the allocations. Um, and what I want to do later is sort of point out that the update of the uh, Allocations is like the E step in an AM algorithm, and the update of the means is like an M step in the EM algorithm. Yeah, OK. So I think I've gone slightly over my first half. So that will be 
what I'll do next is introduce... OK, well, I just finished with this. Um, other clustering approaches in machine learning. I did have a section, so I didn't introduce this section properly. I moved from supervised learning to unsupervised learning and started talking about clustering without properly introducing it because I put these slides together an hour ago. Um, but other, uh, I'm not going to talk about dimensionality reduction. Anyone know why I'm not going to talk about dimensionality reduction? Because <laughs> you've had six hours on that already. Um, so other clustering approaches in machine learning, spectral clustering, this is really cool. It allows clusters which aren't convex hulls. It's based on a, a relaxation of an optimization problem, initially proposed by Sheehan Malik, an important work in machine learning done by Andrew Ng, uh, Mike Jordan, and someone else who I'm forgetting. Uh, this form of clustering only allows clusters that in the data space are convex hulls. So you can't have a cluster, for example, that spins around in a circle or something. And, and that's, you know, when we look at clustering, we think, oh, these data are close together. They should be part of the same cluster. But this doesn't allow for that. It just allows data which are near in terms of Euclidean distance. So spectral clustering is a really cool way of doing that, that uh, is a relaxation of an optimization problem. Um, and then Dirichlet processes, you're going to hear about uh, from Zubin. And good point to say that you, at 5 o'clock, Dilan's going to start, going to talk to you about Kingman's coalescence, um, uh, which is related to Bayesian non-parametric methods. So Dilan's going to come forward and give a talk then um, with Fernando not being here. So um, Dirichlet processes are a probabilistic formulation. So this is an optimization formulation, and this is a probabilistic formulation for a clustering algorithms that are non-parametric. Um, Non-parametrics, uh, I think, are one of the really exciting areas of Bayesian learning, but Zubin's going to talk to you a lot about them, as well as Peter Obantz and John Cunningham and Dinan. So I won't say too much more about that. So after the break, we'll come back and talk about maximum likelihood regression um, from a probabilistic perspective. And I'll want to do a bit more. One of the things I think is interesting is what people think Bayesian modeling is versus what it actually is. Bayesian modeling is not using Bayes rule. OK, I mean, it does use Bayes rule. But if you use Bayes rule, you're not being Bayesian. OK? People, some people disagree with Bayesian modeling. You can't disagree with Bayes rule. It's an obvious consequence of the laws of probability. Um, so if you say, I'm not going to use Bayes rule, you're just being dumb. <laughs> but there is a difference between the Bayesian and frequentist approach, and I'll try and highlight where that comes from and what it is philosophically. It's associated with its epistemic and aleatoric uncertainty. Um, and I'll use regression for motivating that, uh, first by maximum likelihood and then by Bayesian perspective. And if there's time at the end, I'll briefly talk about EM algorithms and try and introduce variational methods briefly through the EM algorithm. Okay, so back in five minutes, I guess. <laughs>